few days ago, we celebrated Canada Day, and uh, I thought it would be interesting to bring out one or two things about Canada Day itself as I go into the message for today. Canada Day, in, of course, as we know it now, um, is the celebration of what we call the independence of Canada. Now, the independence in that sense is not the same independence as we know it in some countries. And therefore, the word Canada Day was not used in Canada until 1982. And the reason was because it was in 1982 that people said, we no longer want to use the name that we used before, which was Dominion Day. Dominion Day was used right from when it was started, I think, in 1879 till about 1982, when a private member's bill was passed. And then they decided, forward, we will not call it a Dominion Day, but we will call it Canada Day. And so Canada Day, as it is, is a celebration of the freedom of association that the nation of Canada has with England. And that is why you will still notice that as part of the Commonwealth, we have a joint heritage and we also do things that benefit both countries. It's also interesting that when you listen to the anthem of Canada, when you listen to that anthem, you will notice that there are some words there that me and you can identify with. It says our home and what? and native land. Occasionally, people say, people ask me where is home. And when they say where is home, I say home is where things are good. <laughs> Amen? And, from, and in my circumstance, where is home? Here. Yeah. And so where is home? Yeah, yeah. Here. Now, people will go forward occasionally then to ask me, then if you are from Canada, which part of Canada are you from? And I got tired of compla not complaining, I got tired of answering the question so many times until I met a wise man. He said, when they ask you that, I said that you are Eskimo. <laughs> and so when I say that, they know that you shouldn't ask me any question about that again. I am Canadian, I am Canadian. I am native of the land, just like God has brought you here. And as far as you have the benefits of the land, our anthem says from where? From far and wide. And then there's a prayer there. It says, God, keep our land. Doesn't matter what anybody says, as far as those words are in the anthem, God will keep the land. Amen. As far as those words are proclaimed every time that the national anthem is sung, God will keep the land. Amen. It is an acknowledgement that as a nation, we understand that it is only God that can keep a land. The Bible says that the watchmen stay awake in bed. It is only God that can do what God can do. And so on this, I want to remind us of James chapter 5 verse 16. James 5, 16, the Bible says, confess your sins to what? And then do what? Pray for one another that you may be what? Healed. For some reason, we have always thought praying and the confession has to do with only physical healing. There's something that you will have heard about called truth and reconciliation. Truth and reconciliation has to do with confessing sins and praying for one another, and then both parties heal. Physical healing is easy. Emotional healing is tough. And so I cannot say that what you are saying doesn't make sense. I did not go through what you went through. Are we together? I remember somebody in power said not too long ago, and the person said that he was not a historian, and so he doesn't really care about what happened before. And I thought to myself that I should think there should be a class speaking. 
when you get into office. Because either you are acknowledging it or not, the things that happened before is the foundation of the behavior of certain people towards others in the same country. I often use the example of Iraq. If you woke up as a five-year-old boy in Iraq in the morning to the sound of gunshots, and you see people with the American badge kill your father, it's difficult for somebody to say forget about it. The boy will grow with what? With vengeance. The only way that boy can heal is when somebody brings him together and says, we know we did wrong. It's not everything that we did that was right, because we are not perfect, right? We know we did wrong. We apologize wrong. We pray that you heal. We pray that we heal. And then all of us can get better. And so scripture actually gives us what a nation needs to heal, if only we will take it. Scripture gives us not just a nation, it gives us what a church needs to heal. Scripture gives us what citizens need to heal. And that is why as I take my text today, I read from Philippians chapter 3 verse 17. Philippians 3 17. Apostle Paul is talking here. He says, brothers and sisters, together, follow my example and observe those who live by the pattern that we gave you. For there are many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, who live as enemies of the cross of Christ, whose faith is destruction, whose God is their belly. And whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who focus their mind on earthly and what, and temporal things, but our what, citizenship is in heaven, and from there we eagerly wait the coming of the Savior, who by exerting that power enables him to subject everything to himself by transforming us by transforming our earthly bodies. But then either you like it or not, I want to start this morning. One of the prayers I usually pray when people tell me that Pastor Conga, uh, we are happy to share that we are now citizens of Canada. One of the prayers I always pray is that citizenship in Canada is temporal. But there is a better citizenship and that is the citizenship of heaven. Of course, I don't emphasize it so much because then they say pastor is not happy that they got their citizenship. <laughs> but I will put it in for you to understand that citizenship in Canada can be taken away, but nobody can take away your citizenship in heaven, Amen. except you yourself decide to walk away. I read long ago of people that had certain problems and even though they were born in the land, because the problems were beyond the kind of problem that we wanted in Canada. Canada deported them to the land of their fathers that they had never been before. <laughs> that is why I always thank God that I'm a citizen of heaven. And so when we talk about belonging, I will talk very briefly about one of two things because of time that are the benefits when you belong to the kingdom that is unshakable. Because when you belong to that kingdom, it doesn't matter what man may try, the benefits of the kingdom will accrue to you. Likewise, there are some things that God then will expect of you because in a kingdom, kingdom is sustained by the efforts of the citizens. Let me say that again. Every kingdom is sustained by the efforts of the citizens of the kingdom. Dare I not mention any name? If you see a country that is given to corruption, it is not the land. What is the problem? It is people that are given to what? Corruption. 
If you see a people that are giving to whatever price there is, it is not the land that is the problem. The problem is that people themselves, what they do is what the country becomes. Are we together? Yes. Thank God, me and you cannot change the value of the kingdom of God. Amen. It doesn't matter what we do, the values of the kingdom of God are set. That's why the Bible says we have an unshakable kingdom. When you become to the kingdom of Canada, for example, as a citizen, you are expected to speak well of your country. As a citizen, you are expected to keep your country tidy. As a citizen, you are expected to voluntarily pay tax. As a citizen, you are expected to do everything within your power to make sure that the country is going in the right direction. So brethren, if you're a citizen of heaven, what does God expect of you? The Bible says that to whom much is given, is what? Expect. It means, if you go back to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is not by works. Let no man boast. It says what? It is the free gift. My salvation is equal to your salvation. It doesn't matter how many sins you had. But the Bible rightly says, to whom much is given, much is expected. Apostle Paul, because I will read it in Acts chapter 27. He obtained one major benefit, and he mentioned it, and I will talk about it in the second service. When they were selling out, he said, look, I perceive that as we are going, this journey will be with much hurt of both the sheep and ourselves. You remember that passage? And the Bible says that they didn't listen to him, so they left. This is own. It doesn't matter where you are. As far as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, the angels of heaven. And so even though Paul was a prisoner, I read that story and I laughed again. Paul that was a prisoner was the one now telling people that were free what to do. He opened his mouth and he said, let me just read it for you so that we can follow that. Acts chapter 26. I will read verse 23. It says, I, let me read verse 22. It says, I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of what? Of the sheep. Now, that is different from what he said in the beginning. What he said in the beginning was that there will be loss of both sheep and lives. That was at the human understanding level. He did not understand the other things that were going on in heaven. When heaven came down, now he knew. He said, ah, now it has been told to me that no life should be lost, but you still lose the sheep. And then he went on to verse 23. He said, for there stood by what? By me this night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve. But then let me quickly differentiate belonging and serving because of time. When you belong, it means that you have a sense to be a part of something that's belonging. When you belong, it means that you are related and that you are affiliated with something. It says, to whom I belong, meaning that Paul no longer counts himself as part of any other group, but he counts himself as part of the kingdom of God. He goes on to say, Give me one second. Yep, to whom I belong and whom I serve. Now, let me talk about the service a little bit. The service here is under many, many headings. Paul served as an apostle. Paul served as a child. Paul served as a subject. Paul served as God's spoken person. God served as a son and heir to the kingdom. And above everything else, Paul was a living sacrifice. 
But then Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Do not be conformed to the ways of this world, but present your bodies what? A living sacrifice. What did he say you should present? Your body. That is labor. It is often interesting when we say, I'm a living sacrifice, but we only serve when it is convenient. It is often interesting. I don't know, let me, let me take you back a little bit. How many of you understand that when you sacrifice something, you are no longer in control of it? Amen. You are no longer, how many of you agree with me? In those days, people that sacrifice the traditional way, when they take a sacrifice and they put it where they tell them to put it, what are they told to do? Turn back and never look back again. Some of you have heard that, right? But for some reason, we have made a living sacrifice such that when I put it down, I stand by it and say, God, today it is not convenient. I take my thing. When it's convenient, I lay it down again. A living sacrifice means you have let go. A living sacrifice means whatever I will do. I love the way Apostle Paul said it. He said, I labored more than them all. Brethren, in the kingdom, you have to labor. There are benefits for laborers in the kingdom. In fact, Apostle Paul also told us because there's a spiritual part of it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he said, I thank my God, I speak in tongues more than you all. The spiritual part, I am there. The physical part, I am there. But then Canada was not built on only spiritual profession. The kingdom of God cannot be built only on verbal profession. The kingdom of God will be built with sweat, tears, and thank God for the blood of Christ. So what do I have to give? Sweat. What do I have to give? Tears. Remember what David said. He said, I will not give God something that will not cost me. Brethren, the kingdom is good. Oh, I can tell you that. Because when the angel came to Paul, and everybody was thinking, maybe we are going to die, Paul had inside information. Brethren, I pray that you have inside information. Amen. That is why occasionally you will notice that when things are bothering other people, some other people are just relaxed. Because they have what? Inside information. And it is not getting the inside information that is the problem. It is believing it. And that is why Apostle Paul went further in that passage. He said, I believe God that it will be exactly as it was told to me. Brother, whatever God has told you, you can't change the way it happen. You can write that down. You can't. Unless God has not spoken. If God has not spoken, it's good. But if God has spoken, you can't change what will happen. Last week I was watching the service online. And of course we were talking about forgiveness and all those things. And suddenly my attention was diverted and I went to David. And God told David, for this thing that you have done, no problem. You've asked for forgiveness, I forgive you. He said, but that baby, forget about it. The baby must die. And the Bible says that David kept on fasting and hoping that God would do what? Change his mind. And eventually when the baby died, the Bible says that David changed. He perfumed himself and he went to eat. And somebody said, ah, won't you mourn for the child? He said, I already mourned all these days while I was waiting that God would change his mind. But then let me tell you the truth. If God couldn't change his mind for Jesus Christ, he can't change his mind for you. Because Jesus Christ said, if possible, let this cup pass over me. I am proud I belong to the kingdom. I am proud that I'm a citizen of Canada. But one thing I need to tell you is this. 
whatever we do to build the physical, we need to do it to build the spiritual. And then you will get the benefits of it. In the second service, by the grace of God, I will have time to break some things down. But I want you to go with the mind that because you are a citizen and you openly belong, location doesn't matter. God will find you there. The people standing against you don't matter. God will rescue you. Everything that the enemy is throwing in your way won't matter. Why? Because the angels of God are there to guide you. The Bible says he will send his angels charge over you that you will not. You will not dash your foot against a stone. The benefits of the kingdom are more than the benefits of belonging to the kingdom. In fact, there are no benefits of not belonging to the kingdom. Whatever benefit that you think you get, they are temporal. And the Bible says that these temporal things that we see, they will do what? They will fade away. But then, in the kingdom, there are citizens and there are citizens. To Paul stands today is a different kind of citizen. There are citizens of the kingdom that they are not shakers and movers of the kingdom. And there are citizens of the kingdom that the history of the kingdom will not be complete without them. Just like the history of Canada cannot be complete without mentioning some names. The history of every nation cannot be complete without mentioning names. Most countries start from their airports. And most airports in the world are named after citizens of the country that have established themselves. If you've traveled, even if you don't travel, just listen on TV, you will hear Toronto Airport, it has a name. Montreal Airport, it has a name. All of these airports have a name because they were different kinds of citizens. And so here's my question as I leave this morning. What kind of citizens will you be? Will you be a citizen that when time has passed, only your family will remember that you passed by? Or will you be a citizen that people will be struggling and clamoring to have your name mentioned in everything that they want to remember for life? The choice is yours, the choice is mine. It is that sense of belonging that makes you to do the things that you do that God is looking for.